Because everybody is too polite and nobody wants to start. Uh, maybe uh, I start uh, our seminar. I'm Alexander Busgalin. Can you hear me? Can you see me, comrades, colleagues? Yes. Everything is perfect. Great. So I decided to prepare a small surprise for you. Uh, because you have a carnival, you have a lot of fun. And we also have a lot of fun, but this is a little bit another fun. So now you can see Russian winter. Can you see this? A lot of snow everywhere. So just to, to give you the smell of our life. Uh, I think it is important sometimes. <laughs> and um, you are now uh, exactly opposite, uh, on the opposite side of the globe. <laughs> and this is very interesting, but we are together and our hearts, our brains, uh, our souls are together. And this is important. Uh, really, I'm full of emotions. Uh, it's uh, very unusual for academic meetings. But uh, for me, Brazil is an extremely important space, uh, time, life, because my first experience of social forums was in San Paulo. No, it was first meeting in Porto Alegre. It was forum in Porto Alegre. Uh, thousands of people, uh, demonstration, 100,000 people, a lot of uh, beauty, songs, uh, dancing very interesting academic debates, very interesting political debates. So fiesta and academic symposium during one week without opportunity to sleep more than three hours, uh, but with opportunity to dance more than three hours. So it was really great. Uh, today, unfortunately, we cannot dance and we cannot think, but we have time for interesting uh, debates. And the topic is uh, really very uh, actual. Uh, because the human being, uh, personality, is the most important question for development. Uh, until now, uh, big bosses are talking about profit, growth, growth of gross national product and so on. But uh, they forget about lives, about development of personality. Sometimes this is a problem of hunger and survival. Sometimes this is a problem of absence of uh, goal, of values, uh, alienated life. But in both cases, this is a global tragedy. And we are living in the situation when social system, neoliberal capitalism, late capitalism, created atmosphere of totalitarian alienation, alienation everywhere. Uh, everything for sale. This is uh, not the joke. Uh, education, uh, culture, everything became commercialized and alienated from personality. Uh, labor became, uh, or not became, still is uh, the sphere where you cannot develop yourself, where you are alienated also. And when we are looking for alternatives, we have to take this into the account not to be pure economists who see only uh, figures of uh, economic dynamic, not to be pure specialists in psychology for whom only sex and sexual behavior is a problem of life or in different complexes of personality, uh, not to be postmodernist philosopher who wants to talk about deconstruction, uh, deterioration uh, and um, absence of uh, big narratives. So we have to find new uh, problems, uh, new space of problems. It is also important to put big questions. And for young generation, I think this is important. When I started my academic work, it was, I was 17 years old. Uh, and with my friend Andre Kalgana, we decided that this is the time to write new Das Kapital. Das Kapital of the 20th century, it was uh, 20th century. So, and all my life, all his life, we are working to realize this ambitious and uh, not realistic, but very good goal. Uh, I think uh, everybody from you can and must maybe even have such goal to make, to realize big ambitious project, which is extremely necessary for people. 
not only for development of your creativity, not only for your academic career, for people. And our seminar put this topic because of that. So I wish you big luck. I'm sure that we have uh, good debates. We are starting very important debates. Uh, this seminar can grow. We have uh, colleagues everywhere in Latin America and Europe and the United States. And uh, we have ambitious plan to build or to grow up better to say international uh, seminar of uh, young Marxists. Uh, and it doesn't matter how old are you. Sometimes I feel myself also very young, uh, but uh, I think we will put limits for uh, professors and we will have chance only to put questions and to say hello in the beginning and in the end, but not to participate as speakers. So some uh, limits and restrictions for us, not bad idea. So uh, that's it. And uh, Maybe Paula uh, continue and tell more about topics and uh, problems. Paola, where are you? Please, the microphone, Paola. Okay. Good morning. Uh, we, we are listening to me. Yes, everything is perfect. Ah, хорошо. Хорошо, я согласен. Well, in our first meeting, <coughs> Yes, that is perfect. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, we just delay. Uh, I, I'm listening with delay. Oh, we have to close the page from YouTube. Yes, but I don't I don't I don't know what happened. Пожалуйста, закройте страницу да на YouTube. I'm trying I'm trying to, to, to enter, but I don't know what happened. Paulo, você tem que sair do YouTube aí, só ficar no Zoom. Tá bom, então deixa eu ver o que está acontecendo aqui. Fechou, Agora você tem que abrir o microfone. So, friends, I have proposal. Maybe we um, start our seminar, and then Paola, when she decide solve all his problems. Uh, we'll continue and we'll include uh, in our seminar and we will listen to his introduction, his... Uh... Uh, sure. Ah, okay, great. Well, in our first seminar, I must to say that we live in a unique world whose historical barriers are now more permeable. This holds true, both through the forces of emancipation and for those of universal regression, regression, of course. So it's possible to create the tissue of the network of collective affinities that we are already doing now. There are the possibility of dialogue, the exchange of ideas, 
free, voluntary, and conscious collective intellectual work, the exploration and deepening of theoretical and practical results as a way of organizing or emancipation as Marx wanted. And now I think that we must to begin <laughs> after my uh, spend of the time There are immense challenges posed by the creation of a new world order demanded by the new financial capital. For the ex-colonial and neo-colonial world, first of all, this implies the systematic destruction of nation states. Such a process creates immense economic, social, and political contradictions, a kind of permanent counter-revolution and more or less anti-capitalist democratic revolutions aimed at socialism. This process impacts on scientific research of an academic nature by progressive intellectuals of various ideological spectrum. I believe this will be evident in this and other seminars by young Russian and Brazilian science. We hope that such seminars will be fruitful and have a long life. That's all. Yeah, thank so you. All. Yeah, thank you, Paolo. So first of all, uh, good morning and good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, we have, uh, I'm sure we have a very interesting meeting today. And by the way, today is a very important date. Uh, today is the 100 years anniversary of uh, USSR State Planning Committee. So I would like to congratulate everyone with it. That's the not main topic of our discussion, but it's an example of alternative ways, alternative to neoliberalism. Uh, and uh, I think we will uh, propose um, from different from different sides, I would say. So to start with the uh, to start our discussion, I would like to give a word to Professor Enrique Novaes. He's a professor at the Faculty of Philosophy and Sciences in uh, San Paulo State University. So Enrique, please, and please, uh, 10 minutes is a time limit for everyone. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Enrique Tanovais. I am economist and philosophy doctor. I am professor at State University of Sao Paulo, and I am member of IBEC and GEPOD. My presentation is about environmental collapse, agroecology, and schools of agro agroecology in Brazil. I would like to congratulate, congratulate Professor Busgalin Paulo, Fabiana, Natalia, Jacob, and Gleb. I hope we have an excellent first seminar of young schoolers. Uh, I divided my presentation in three parts. Part one, environmental collapse and advancement of agribusiness. Part two, agroecology. Part three, schools of agroecology in Brazil. I remember that Istvan Mezaros said that the advance of productive forces become an advance of destructive forces. Michel Louvi said that capitalism is intrinsically unsustainable. In Brazil, we have a multiplication of social environment crimes as a result of advance of agribusiness. For example, murder of Chico Mendes, Dorothy Stang, uh, crime of nine companies in Mariana with 20 deaths, Brumadinho with more than 300 deaths. Uh, the advance of agri ag agribusiness 
uh, have a political dimension. We had to remember that we have a rest restoration of the power of the landlords since 1964 Cup. We had a new capitalist cycle of land expropriation and the advancing of agricultural, agricultural frontier. We had a state reform with increasing state control by agribusiness, reform of universities, education, technical education, reform of technical assistance in rural areas, and abundant credits for farmers. Uh, the advancement of agribusiness have an economic and technical scientific dimensions too. The so-called Green Revolution, ba based on concentration of land, ownership, monoculture, tractors, pesticides, agrochemicals, genetically modified organisms, synthetic fertilizers, changed the country size in Brazil and in the world. John, Bella, John Bellamy Foster, for example, perceived as the industrializ industrialization of agriculture. We have some consequences of this advance. Social crisis, concentration of land and income, expulsion of small farmers, murder of leaders and social of social movements, destruction of Cerrado and of the Amazon and implications for the destruction of aquifers, technological dependence of small producers, schools closing, environmental crisis, and food poisoning. Brazil has become the largest cons consumer of agrochemicals in the world. Now I will try to say something about the agroecology in Brazil. Agroecology is the result of struggles by social movements and non-governmental organizations to produce and consume healthy food. Struggles to agroecological production in the settlements, attempts to sell organic products in the city, attempts to do agroecological research at universities, struggles to reduce hunger, poverty, malnutrition in the countryside and in the city. In the agenda of social movements, we have the decommodification of food, the decommodification of seeds, food sovereignty, gender equality in rural areas, of social movements, cooperation and cooperativism, and the defense of agrarian reform. They promoted some actions like manifests of for food sovereignty, struggles against genetic modified organisms, campaign, campaigns against agrochemicals, struggles against transnational corporations, attacks on corporations, Congress of Social Movements, Technical Schools Creation, public, publication of books, and partnerships with unions and universities to pro promote marketplace in this space. Now I'm going to explain about schools of agroecology in Brazil. These schools, these schools were created to technical qualification. The technicians carry out the agroecological transition in the settlements. They form basic education teachers in the agroecology paradigm. They organize congress and conference of agroecology. They practice radical democracy, self-management, self-organization, based on the theory of some Russians like Pistrak, Krupska, and others. With the 16 coup and Bolsonaro elections, these schools are having a hard time surviving. This is my presentation. I hope you enjoy it. 
Passivo by Shoy Tavarish. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Enrique. It's very good that we started with the, such interdisciplinary approach. That is, I think, the key approach that can solve current problems. Uh, so I suggest uh, to give a word to another speaker and then when the part uh, one will finish, we can start with the discussion and questions and finally, all speakers can respond to the questions and have a conclusion. So please, uh, the next speaker is uh, Natalia Yakolia. She is a leading researcher at Center for Modern Marxist Studies, the Faculty of Philosophy at Lomonosov Moscow State University. And also she is a researcher at the Institute of Economics of Russian Academy of Sciences. Natalia Gennadyevna, please. Uh, thank you very much, Gleb. Hello, dear comrades. Uh, my topic, crisis of neoliberal capitalism, the desocialization of education. One minute of my presentation. Uh, so, uh, neoliberal capitalism now has led to the total domination of the market and financial capital. It caused the desocialization of the economy and society. We are witness uh, an increase in social inequality and poverty, a sharp reduction in free and uh, preferential public goods, and a reduction in budget funding for the social sphere. Uh, all this uh, led to the stagnation and crisis of the capitalist system. We observe these processes all over the world, from North and South America and Europe and Russia. The process of desocialization affected primarily the social sphere, medicine, education, culture. In my report, I will focus on the desocialization of the education sphere. Um, so, um, we uh, witnessed changes in the education sphere during the last 20, 30 years. The first stage, the sh shortening of state support of education and involving in inter-market relations, and as a result, marketization of it. The second stage, the enlarging of influence of financial aims, markets, spe specific influential persons, corporations on uh, the educational process itself and on the managing of it. I want uh, to underline the financialization of education is just on the early stage, stage of its development. It affects now uh, the sphere of higher education. I mean the universities. It displays itself in the universities of countries with neoliberal economic model, such as the USA, UK, UK Japan, and others. Less it can be witnessed in the countries with high level of socialization of capitalism in Sweden, Austria, Denmark, Finland. In Russia, this process has not displayed itself to a considerable uh, extent, but its genesis is obvious. Now, uh, let us point out the practical display of financialization of education. Um, so, first, the change in ways of financialization of education. On the one hand, the reduction of state budget financialization and the growth of incomes on, of financial investment activities of universities. On the other hand, subordinated, uh, subordination of traditional channel of financing of the education uh, to the financial capital. I mean payments for education. Uh, in the developed countries, especially in the USA, this traditional way of financing is realized now through credits the students get uh, have led 
to huge debts on such credits and formed the depends of students and education sphere on the financial institutions and financial capital. For example, the depends of, uh, on education credits in the USA since 2007 up to now has grown to one um, of 49%. And as the Financial Times said, the total debt on the USL students in 2018 uh, exceeded uh, one and a half trillion dollars. Uh, so second, uh, we can point out the process of growing up or the role of economic and financial departments in the university structure. This economic fi finance and investment departments uh, dominate over the education and scientific departments. They subordinate education and scientific departments, regulate and control their activities. Uh, for example, the, um, for example, sorry, Harvard Managing Corporation, the special managing company set by, uh, by University of Harvard, to manage the endowment fund is a very successful investor. Uh, double rector of Harvard University, Derek Bock, said the increase of endowments goes up thanks to gains of investments. There are also changes in the way of managing in uni the universities. During the last two decades, more and more representatives of business uh, became the members of trusteeships of universities. Mainly, uh, they represent not the real sector, but financial sector. And uh, as a, a result, the top leadership get into strength dependence on business and financial capital. Uh, so, third, uh, the external condition dictated by state, business, and financial capital turn contemporary universities into commercial and bureaucratic business structures. They uh, do also call them businessmen's university or 3.0 generation universities. The con uh, contemporary universities are characterized with competition for best students and for state financing, creation of tough uh, authority system with uh, a lot of bureaucracy, turning the financial indicators to the main ones of educational and scientific activities of departments and uh, teachers. Uh, for, um, first of all, the changes uh, of structure and contents of educational process, they change the set of faculties, subjects, and the ways of training. But the students are subordinated by this process too. This very process turns uh, to become, became the ideology of contemporary global capitalism. The education becomes the main channel of generating the value system and the way of mentality. As a result, the human finances is formed as prevailing type of personality. Thus, the university become the conductors of ideology of financialization in the society. In the, this way, the um, intensi uh, uh, intensity uh, the process as uh, uh, in economic. Uh, so in the society on the whole. Uh, so conclusion. The education system, uh, the contemporary education system, which is uh, undergoing the process of marketization and financialization, can increase the regression of society. It is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, education is the real basis of uh, all modern production, so we cannot is generate the necessity to discuss these subjects. And um, the next speaker is going to talk about quite close theme. 
Um, I would like to give a word to Fabiana Rodriguez, who is a professor at the Faculty of Education at the University of uh, Campinas and also in postgraduate program in education. Fabiana, please, you're welcome. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute, please. I, I will share my slides. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank all my colleagues from Russia and from Brazil for the organization of this event. I'm very pleased to have the chance to discuss such important topics with you. I'm a professor at Unicamp and I have been studying the challenge of public education and the Brazilian history, especially the relations among social classes, race, and gender in the national educational context. Under the crisis of neoliberal capitalism, the education has been transformed more and more into a commodity. In the historical moment of cap capitalism, the education has been transformed more than ever into a business a commodity that moves the interests of international oligopolies all over the world. Obviously, the interests in education don't come only from the possibilities of making significant profits with that. They also come from the necessity of capital to ideologically control an otherwise revolted population that lives in an increasing state of poverty. Nowadays in Brazil, the private foundations closely connected with the richest people in the world and the multinational companies have been firmly conducting the educational government agencies, such as the National Council of Education. They are the educational entrepreneurial reformists who have been working to increase the privatization of public education. Given the economic and ideological motivations, the educational policies have been based on, on evaluation, accountability, and meritocracy, using large-scale assessment and reducing the public resources for education. The competition individualism and precariousness have been the essence of these educational policies. We believe to be crucial to point this fact out. The educational entrepreneurial reformists and their proposals to privatize the whole educational system are leading to a tragedy in a peripheral country such as Brazil marked by historical inequality in education. This is my main focus in this speech. In the fifth, in this period, Brazil lived profound changes, such as the construction of a new capital in the middle of the country, as we can see in the first picture. In uh, education appears as a national issue during the process of intensive, intensive industrialization. 50% of the population was illiterate. There was a huge selectivity. The percentage of illiterates corresponded to 50%. A second end a significant number of students arrived at school, but only 1% graduated. Selectivity explains the data. In order to be able to work, earn money, and provide for their families, the students quitted school before finishing their courses. 
Furthermore, methods and the strict discipline contributed to increasing the school dropouts. In addition, the selectivity expresses the contradictory process of development of Brazil. The dependent industrialization means lack of scientific production and universities. This reality explains why we hadn't been able to universalize schooling during the spread of industrialization and urbanization throughout the decade of 1950s. Lamentably, the fact is, during the time when, when the country lived crucial change, the education in Brazil kept preparing few people for privileged life, while cultivating an archaic and useless school. Popular education to fight illiteracy. The 1950s was a time of intense, intensive political engagement that involved the Communist Party, the left-wing sector from the Catholics and the students. Illiteracy appeared as a crucial concern in these organizations. Paulo Freire, a well-known Brazilian educator, developed a method to teach reading and writing and, at the same time, politicize the students. In the beginning of 1964, some, some weeks before the military coup, the Paulo Freire method had become the one of a national plan to face the national illiteracy. After the military coup, the program was suspended and Paulo Freire was exiled. The, dict uh, the dictatorship educational policies, alienation of educational challenges. During the, dicta during the dictatorship since 1964, the ideology from human capital theory prevailed. The Ministry of Education in Brazil made several agreements with the US agents of international development Following the directives from U.S. aid, what happened was an alienation of real educational challenges in Brazil. The education was considerably reformed in all levels, from basic school education to universities. The results are recognized for keeping selectivity and producing profound social inequalities. The two pictures here show the resistance of students against these agreements. Afterwards, the quantitative outcomes registered the complete failure of these policies. In, 19, in 1976, 7.5% of people were illiterate in urban areas while just about 31% were illiterate in the countryside. In the Northwest of the country, a substantial number of the population was not able to read and write. Nearly 52% were illiterate. In the same years, the educational statistics presented a relatively modest schooling rate 67% of the country as a whole, with significant difference between countryside and urban areas, 8% and 50% respectively. This school as a reproductive space of selectivity, social class inequalities, sexism and racism was a disastrous result from these policies. You arrive here in the new republic. In the, per in the first picture, we can see the symbolic character, Lula, leading a demonstration against the dictatorship. The new republic started in 1985 with a civil president. In the 1980, 
the educational reform to democratize the school was brought back to the public debate. Following the debate about the challenges of democracy, public education appeared as a central issue. The social movements, teachers, intellectuals, feminists, and the black movement struggled for the democratization of public education in different levels. At the same time, the right wing prepared their answers connected with the directives from multilateral organizations, such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. In the second picture, we can see an illustration that sums up the drama. More and more money for the public debt and total scarcity of resources to public education. The right wing organized their forces and despite the social movements has been imposing their neoliberal and privatizing educational agenda, especially after the 90s. Wrapping up, the, only, the neoliberal agenda of educational reforms has been intensified in a peripheral country such as Brazil. The disaster is enormous because it's a country that didn't overcome the heritage of barbarism breeding since the colonialism. Never in our history were we able to reach a public educational system minimally egalitarian. Nowadays, the percentage of functional literacy corresponds to 29% of Brazilian people. In other words, 29% of people between 15 and 64 years old in Brazil has severe difficulties in reading and writing. The extreme exploitation of work, the racism and the male chauvinism are the essence of inequalities in education. This grave circumstance has been exacerbated with policies that answer the capital interests. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana. As I said, uh, this uh, research was quite close to the previous speaker's ideas. Uh, I bet you even can be a co-author of uh, some cooperative research with the previous speaker, because there are so many quite similar ideas. So thank you. We are going to the next speaker, who will be the last in this part. Uh, so I give the word to Jacob Zeishli, who is a Canadian and uh, nowadays probably a bit Russian researcher, who is an economics teacher at Plekhanov Russian University of Economics. Please, Jacob. Hello, Hello everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I think this is a, uh, a very useful event to facilitate dialogue on the crises of neoliberalism. Today, I'm going to be speaking about capitalism and uh, the global mental health crisis. So, although once considered a relatively taboo subject, mental health has rapidly emerged as a topic of serious discussion in the West. Perhaps the sheer scale of the ongoing crisis has made this discussion unavoidable. Research from the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology Neuropsycho has estimated that over 38% of Europeans suffer from a mental disorder in any given year. It has been further estimated by the National Council for Behavioral Health that approximately half of the American population will experience mental illness at some point in their lives. And the ongoing pandemic seems to have made the situation considerably worse rates of severe major depression, suicidal ideation, and anxiety among youth and adults have increased dramatically since 2019. This is not simply a human crisis, however, but a significant crisis for capital as well. For the economic costs of mental illness, which include factors such as medical expenditures, workplace absence, and reduced productivity, 
are real and increasing. In the UK, for instance, the economic costs of mental illness, which total 110 billion pounds per year, are far, far higher than those of crime and are indeed expected to double over the next 20 years. Research from Dresden's Institute of Clinical Psychology and Psychotherapy sheds further light on the scope of this crisis. Quote, between 2011 and 2030, the cumulative economic output loss associated with mental disorders is projected to be 16.3 trillion US dollars worldwide making the economic lo output loss related to mental disorders comparable to that of cardiovascular diseases and higher than that of cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes. It is clear that the mental health crisis must be counted among the major challenges of our era. And similar to other crises, which include intensifying geopolitical tensions, a deteriorating biosphere and questionable, questionable rates of profit, I would argue that contemporary capitalism is deeply involved in both the making and shaping of the mental health crisis. Let's first discuss the relation of contemporary capitalism to the reproduction of this crisis. Perhaps the most relevant factor here is the so-called neoliberal era of capitalism, in which former bulwarks of social provisioning namely the welfare state and tightly knit communities, have been dismantled in favor of a totalizing subjection of society to the accumulative logic of the market. Oliver James, a British psychologist, noted that when comparing citizens of countries which have retained the welfare state with citizens of countries that have underwent un intense periods of neoliberal governance, the latter are twice as likely to suffer from mental illness. He also highlighted that there is a positive association between mental illness and social inequality. The higher the latter, the greater the risk of the former. On the cultural side of the equation, James suggests that the ideas associated with neoliberalism also play an important role in the spread of mental distress. Centrally, he blames the notions that, quote, material affluence is the key to fulfillment that only the affluent are winners and that access to the top is open to anyone willing to work hard enough, regardless of their familial, ethnic, or social background. I think it is true to say that the Hobbesian mentality of neoliberal ideology is likely incompatible with stability, let alone sound mental health. But I would argue that another important factor to recognize, felt throughout much of the capitalist world, is a collective grieving over the loss of the future. Young people around the world have had their aspirations dashed, and many are expecting to inherit a world worse than that of their parents' generation, a world of fewer opportunities and of ever-increasing precarity. As capitalism struggles in the early 21st century, promises of stable employment, high incomes, families, and home ownership have largely dissipated in the face of debt, offshoring, automation, and the so-called gig economy. This widespread loss of hope in a future of better days has undoubtedly contributed to the intensification of the mental health crisis, especially in young people. These are, of course, but a few ways in which the market seems to be implicated in the ongoing production of mental distress. Much more could be said about this, but out of an interest for time, let us move to examine how capitalism shapes our understanding of mental illness. The first and perhaps most curious fact to acknowledge here is that everyday life is undergoing rapid pathologization. This process is particularly discernible in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM. This is the primary diagnostic manual published by the American Psychiatric Association, consulted by clinicians, researchers, and policymakers alike. In 1952, the first edition of the DSM was released, detailing 106 identifiable mental disorders. The fifth and latest edition of the DSM, published in 2013, identifies over 374 disorders. What can account for this massive expansion? The answer, unfortunately, does not consist entirely in the advancement of clinical science. Indeed, 
there is an entire political economy involved with the identification of novel disorders. This is partially explained by the fact that, for instance, nearly 70% of psychiatrists involved in the development of the latest DSM have significant financial ties to the burgeoning pharmaceutical industry, so-called big pharma. The deep entanglement of capital and the Western psychiatric establishment raises at least two points crucial to understanding the relationship between capitalism and the mental health crisis. The first is clearly commercial. Consider here the so-called drugs revolution in which the institutionalization of the mentally ill was replaced by the commercial sale of pharmaceuticals aimed at regulating behavior. This revolution coincided with the logic of the larger neoliberal counter-revolution, as the costs of state-funded psychiatric institutions were shifted to individuals who would then be responsible for the management of their own mental health through the purchase of pharmaceuticals or the health insurance policies which cover them. Pharmaceutical companies have a vested interest in the pathologization of everyday life the transformation of every conceivable dysfunction into an opportunity for products and profit. It is also worthwhile to note that the development of a side, to note the development of a side industry based on promoting a consumerist approach to well-being. Instruction through meditation and yoga, dubious dietary regimes, and self-help help books have re-emerged as an expanding market of commodities aimed at the attainment of an of a curiously elusive well-being. The mental Sorry, Jacob. Health... So, Jacob, just a couple of minutes left. Okay. Or even the mental... Okay. The mental health crisis is therefore in part perpetuated and extended in scope because it offers new opportunities for consumption and thus the, rel the relentless self-valorization of value. The emerging consumerist conception of well-being brings us to a second crucial point. Capital attempts to control the meaning of mental health in order to regulate the behavior of the workers. It is crucial to note here that, from the perspective of capital, the primary problem associated with mental illness is a lack of productivity. It is therefore no surprise then to see that the dominant depiction of sound mental health consists in an idealized worker and consumer, someone with the energy and enthusiasm for constant productivity and limitless consumption. The mentally healthy worker is not only the worker who comes to work, but who is actively engaged and happy despite the soul grinding character of work under capitalism. The capitalist obsession with pathologizing resistance to value production is reflected in the DSM itself, as Bruce Cohen demonstrates. In the first edition of the DSM, there were only 10 instances in which mental illness was associated with work related issues. In the fifth edition today, there are over 387 instances. In this way, the DSM has itself become a veritable catalog of ways to identify bad proletarians in need of treatment in order to maximize the latter's potential integration into the process of value production. And I will conclude here by saying uh, that this is not to, sit to minimize problems like depression or anxiety, quite the opposite. Rather, the point is to recognize that capital is only interested in these problems to the extent that they hinder productivity or present new opportunities for consumption. Capital cares only about its own continuous expansion, and therefore it bothers itself with our problems only to the extent that they present obstacles to or prospects for that expansion. Any attempt to confront the developing mental health crisis seriously must therefore begin with an attempt to replace our society with one oriented not towards the accumulation of capital, but rather the fulfillment of human needs. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. And uh, thank you to all speakers for following time limits quite exactly. Usually it doesn't happen in the conference where, where I participate, so thank you. Uh, and now we can uh, move to questions and uh, discussions. Uh, so please, everyone who wants to comment uh, uh, previous reports, so you can uh, make brief comments and uh, ask your questions to the speakers. And then I will ask uh, questions from the chat. So anybody wants to co make some comments now? 
Um, okay, then I will start with the questions of uh, Professor Busgalen. Uh, the first question was uh, to uh, Natalia Yakolova. Uh, so, so the question is, can socialization of education develop, be developed without deep social reforms in other spheres? So what can be changed first, education sphere or this process should uh, uh, start from some other area? Another question to Natalia and uh, Fabiana. Can, uh, uh, sorry, just a second. Uh, what can education community make in order to decline commercialization of education? And uh, another question uh, to Jacob. What, what is the role of intellectual private property in the crisis that you described? Do you think we need to make steps in the direction of decline of the role of intellectual private property? Does anybody have other questions? So if not, uh, we can start with the concluding words of our speakers and uh, respond to this, answering this uh, question. So please, uh, Natalia, you can start with uh, this. Uh, OK. So can start from, yeah, questions to you. Uh, okay, um, my son Yaroslav uh, helped me translate. Um, so, uh, Alexander's uh, questions. Так, может ли социализация образования развиваться без социальных реформ в других сферах? Ну. Переведи людям. Да не понял, ты может давай. По моему мнению, социализация образования должна проходить совместно с социализацией в других сферах. То есть социализации образования недостаточно для того, чтобы современное общество пришло в норму и побороло эту проблему десоциализации. Uh, side by side with socialization in other spheres, uh, only together, only a pack, package or only um, combination of reforms can change uh, the world. Uh, next question. What uh, one can change first? Education, which will create new people with more progressive ideas or relations which will create space uh, for activity of new actors. Что первичнее? Образование может сгенерировать прогрессивные идеи и отношения для других сфер или наоборот? По моему мнению, должно происходить изменения социально-экономических, то есть общественных отношений вообще в целом в системе. Well, in my opinion, changes must uh, uh, come together. So um, we have to find the balance between. Uh, reforms in uh, education and uh, in uh, relations. Но при этом система образования имеет огромную роль, так как она может стать либо проводником регресса, либо проводником прогресса в обществе. But essentially, uh, education system is uh, more important because it, it can provide uh, degradation and regression or progress. And uh, Fabian's, uh, sorry, Alexander's question. Uh, what can education community make in order to uh, this line, decline. Uh, decline commercialization of education? Um, 
что может сделать образовательное сообщество, чтобы снизить коммерциализацию образования? По моему мнению, образовательное сообщество должно вести активную работу не только в научном плане, но и именно общественную работу для того, чтобы доносить обществу о всех проблемах, которые есть в образовании, и бороться с ними в том числе. As for me, I think that uh, education community must do uh, scientific work and uh, public work. Uh, we must uh, educate uh, mm, the population of mm, Uh, cities of countryside we must uh, populate the education and so on that is all yeah thank you uh, so Fubiana please answer the question to you Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, I, I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, why do we need all these people? I don't know if I understood very well, but um, I think uh, the problem is what to do with uh, the, the excess of people that uh, the people Uh, who is unnecessary to the system. I think, uh, I don't know if it was this question, but I understood like this. Uh, in Brazil, this is a grave, a very serious problem because we live a process of destruction of industrialization and, uh, and the, the, the population that uh, we, we uh, that can't, anything to do, uh, don't have employ, uh, jobs, it's a serious problem. Then the, the educational system have to answer this problem. And the answer is to produce zombies, to produce uh, adaptable zombies, uh, or uh, to put in prison uh, the black people in Brazil is marked, marked by the genocide and incarceration. Uh, and in the same time, the, the educational system is thinking about how to uh, produce adaptable people. Um, then the, the second question, what can education community community make in order to decline commercialization of education. I think uh, the first step is to understand what's happening. The private foundations and the entrepreneurial reformists are dominating the, the, the educational policies in Brazil. And what does it mean? It's, in, uh, it's important to think about it, to discover, to study. Uh, and uh, now, for example, I received some news uh, uh, that the, the federal government uh, right now is selecting which books the, the children have to read at school. Uh, The books don't. Uh, uh, the books are very poor in contents and with uh, with uh, and dominated by obscurantism because we can't talk about our uh, real problems, our structural problems, um, and inequalities. We don't. We, we don't have to talk about gender. We don't have talk about racism, uh, and I think the first step, step to fight against the commercialization is to uh, understand what the commercialization uh, means. I think 
the business and the obscurantism are very connected. And this is uh, important to know to fight, to face this uh, crucial problem in, the, in our reality nowadays. It's that, and my comments are that. Yeah, thank you, Fabiana. And uh, next, quest next question is to Jacob, except uh, Professor Busgallian's question about intellectual private property. Uh, there is another question from Aline. How is the need to address this crisis in mental health is influencing the development of psychology as a science? Okay, thank you colleagues for uh, those great questions. So first on the matter of intellectual property, well, I believe that the kind of most pivotal insertion of this problem into the global mental health crisis is um, most clearly observable at the point of pharmaceutical companies themselves, right? There's this sort of uh, contention among the companies that uh, the defense of intellectual property rights is pivotal, um, not only to their stability as, as, uh, as sort of corporate entities, but also to innovation in, uh, in the sphere of, uh, well, of pharmaceuticals specifically aimed at, tra at treating uh, mental disorders. So I believe that uh, the, the, the opinion that one could form on uh, the defense of intellectual property, property rights and the, the privileges that pharmaceutical companies enjoy from these rights, uh, that this opinion would be informed by the extent to which uh, we view uh, the progression or the, um, I suppose, the, the, the innovation in uh, pharmaceutical companies as being genuinely socially beneficial. And I believe, in all honesty, I believe that there are many reasons for us to be uh, very, very cautious and very, very, uh, to, to express a lot of concern about this sort of spread of um, the drugs revolution, as I mentioned in my talk. Uh, it's, it's quickly become the case that um, you know, pharmaceutical companies, at least in many Western countries, have developed strong lobbying, uh, well, strong kind of bodies of lobbying with ordinary men, uh, or ordinary uh, health professionals, as well as uh, psychologists, social workers, and so on. So it's becoming easier and easier to gain access in, in uh, these select Western countries to gain easier and easier access to antidepressants and treatments for uh, social anxiety and so on and so forth. And this kind of, I think this is a good bridge to the next question, but to just answer quickly the last part about uh, whether I think we need to take steps, uh, steps in the direction of the decline of uh, the role of intellectual property, I would say, absolutely. I would rather see its abolition <laughs> as a whole. I'd, I'd rather see intellectual property uh, kind of demolished as an organizing principle of our society. Um, on the question on about uh, uh, the mental health, uh, the crisis of mental health influencing the development of so psychology as a science, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, notes to be made here. And the first, perhaps perhaps the most, well, one of the crucial factors I think that is necessary to note here is that um, it's, it's located in the theory itself, right? So, uh, well, theories of treatment themselves. So for example, uh, I don't think that it's much of a surprise that in the 20th century, we saw Marxism uh, or sort of Marxists gravitate more towards investigating psychoanalysis than they did uh, cognitive behavioral theory, like uh, which has now become the sort of dominant strand. Uh, because there's this sort of open space, or at least psychoanalysis appears to have this sort of, um, uh, it, ha it appears to be more open to sort of the social origination of uh, mental disorder. While 
treatments like CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, generally tend to create the sort of um, idea, they generally impart the idea that mental illness is purely personal, right? It's It's disconnected from society, it's disconnected from economics, it's, it's just a, uh, it's sort of the neoliberal answer to mental health. It's your own problem, right? So I would, I would say that uh, in treatment, this is very clear. And it's also reflected also kind of in um, the public perception of uh, psychology's statement on, uh, it's also reflected in uh, the public's perception of mental illness in that there's a tendency to view uh, mental disorders also yeah. as purely biological, uh, purely purely existing yes, as chemical I'm imbalances or this sort of thing. And uh, to this extent, I would say that um, I think a, a, a healthy change in psychology, and I think one that is starting to occur at a greater rate is this greater attention paid to uh, society and this move away from uh, the neoliberal subject to his own, who is responsible for uh, all of their, their entire mental health apparatus. Yeah, okay, thank you. And uh, we can finish with a question from Alin to Enrique. Do you believe that rural schools can be a space of resistance to the depredatory advance of agribusiness in Brazil now uh, during the Bolsonaro government. Besides guaranteeing their own existence, how can they break the agribusiness movement? So please, Enrique. Thank you, Glad. Uh, thank you for the question, Aline. But first of all, I will try to say something about uh, community education. No? I think the schools of agroecology are an example of commodity education. Uh, the, the social movements have the control of the education. In these examples, uh, we have something uh, that Mesaro say about, I don't know the correct, uh, the correct co- quotation, but, but is combined changes, articulate changes of uh, word of labor and education. The, the correct name is education beyond capital. For Mesaros, uh, the schools of social movements have the disalienation of labor, uh, the property of the means of production, and the decommodification of production. The problem, Aline, is that these schools don't have scale. Uh, they don't have power to, um, to uh, expand, to uh, gain ex- ex- scale because the power of the state in the uh, hands of the landlords and transnational cor- corporations. Obviously, they prevent, they block the emancipation education. Uh, adapting one one quotation of uh, Gramsci, no? uh, the new education try to burn, but uh, the old education resists to pass it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Enrique. So in the first part, we discussed uh, many interdisciplinary issues that are for sure very important in the our stage of. Uh, economic development. So if uh, nobody wants to say very last word, no more for no, no more than for 30 seconds, uh, so we can finish or just just one very small uh, comment from anybody or not. Mm, so if not, uh, we can make a small break now and uh, come back to the session two in 10 minutes in exactly at uh, half past five in Moscow time and 
half past 11 in Brazil time. Is it okay? So thank you everyone. See you very soon. Okay.
E aí, Fábio, preparado? E lá vamos nós. <risos> tá sendo tem gravado. Que melhor. <risos> tá, tem que falar melhor que o Jacob, hein? O sotaque dele é... Ele é canadense, como é que eu posso fazer? Tá gravado, <risos> Daí... só que às vezes tá gravado. <risos> Daí é fácil, né? Lógico. Tava brincando. Ai, ai. Eles me deixaram por último, agora dá nisso. Sim, eu tenho que treinar melhor meu inglês aí. É, a conversation. Vou treinar a conversation. Aulas de conversation. Sim, sem dúvida. Eu, eu sou melhor para ler, para falar, eu, eu é, penso em português. Não, é, que, é que a gente não usa, né? A gente mais lê, escreve, né? Mais, mais lê que qualquer coisa. Né? Precisamos treinar a nossa conversation. Não é difícil. A Fabi está um mês treinando a apresentação, arrasou. Viu, <risos> Decorou, vamos dançar. I have a wonderful teacher, I can indicate a teacher to you. Very well, Fabi falou muito bem, Fabi. É. We must learn conversation, Fabi. Calão, cabeludo, como é que vai? Tudo bom? Tudo. Mal, mal, foi gosto. <risos> o, o que faço aqui? <risos> tudo bem com você? Faz tempo que a gente não se vê? Tudo bem, tudo bem, você tudo bem? Tudo sobrevivendo aqui a, é. a esse isolamento social. É. Mas tudo bem, pensando. Para onde vai o, o teu presidente? É. <risos> Interessante, né? O Centrão, ele foi abduzido pelo Centrão e agora é. tem que pagar o pedágio, né? É, mas esse, de, esse decreto das armas é, é ah, bem bom, claro tem... para onde ele ah, vai. Ah, sim, né? claro, claro, claro. <risos> claro. Ele, eles querem poder de qualquer jeito e vão mesmo para as cabeças, né? É. O, 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 o capital financeiro é que está se sentindo perdido, né? Eles montaram nesse cavalo. É. Bom, arrancaram a independência do Banco Central, né? É, pois é, tá vendo? Tudo é relativo, né? É. Gente, a gente está ao vivo, tá? No YouTube, só para lembrar vocês. Sem falar nada próprio. <risos> Let's keep in English. Everybody's, everybody returned, all right? And start the second part. So, let, let's start now. Let's... So, uh, <clears throat> good morning to you all researchers here and everybody who's watching us. So, we're going to start the second part of the seminar. Uh, we, we got four researchers here. Tamara Stepanova, who uh, will present Human Capital Development Contradictions. She's PAG candidate from the political economy on, uh, uh, on political economy in the Faculty of Economics. Lom Lomonosov, Moscow State University. Uh, and then uh, Aline Marcondes Miglioli, who will, will present housing in Update, updating Cuba's socialism, considerations on Cuban real estate market. She is PhD candidate in uh, um, Institute of Economics of, from, uh, of the University of Campinas. And then Nikolai Akhmedov, 
who will present Marxist gender studies, theory and practice. He's from uh, Lomono Solve, Moscow State University, graduate. And uh, last one, Fabio Castro, who will present Lithium and Viverbin, Zobre Rhine, and transition and interpretation, interpretation about Bolivia. So we've got uh, 10 minutes for each one, and then 15 to 20 minutes to our debate. So uh, let's start. Uh, please, Tamara, you can start. Uh, you have to put the sound. Uh, yes, on. I'm sorry. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, so, in the conditions uh, of the onset of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, the attention of scientists uh, is drawn to the various uh, processes, uh, uh, to the various pro uh, to various processes accompanying this transition. And um, it's not only about the introduction uh, of uh, cyber-physical systems into mass production and the accompanying changes in uh, global economy. Uh, it is also about the understanding of the significantly increased uh, role of man, uh, which has become stronger in the last uh, half century. Uh, the development of uh, human potential um, as uh, one of the main resources of the economy is one of the most pressing and studied issues today. Um, there are several concepts in economics that have uh, emerged in response uh, to the changing role of man in the economy. Uh, the most widespread are the theory of human capital and the theory of the creative class. However, they both uh, have significant limitations. Uh, scientists have uh, criticized human capital theory since its uh, genesis uh, for its unfortunate, uh, unfortunate name. Uh, the term uh, capital uh, has a very uh, vague, uh, indistinct meaning in the neoclassical school, and accordingly, um, the definition of human capital is not clearly defined. Invest and make a profit is a rule that logically connects human capital and capital, but uh, in the case of a person, the situation is much deeper and more complicated to use such a term. The problem of the theory of human capital is not only in the definition. Uh, it gave rise uh, to the trend of rational self-development self, uh, in modern society. Uh, the individual uh, should uh, constantly uh, assess uh, the labor market and invest uh, in uh, training for the highest paid professions in order to maximize the return on investment in the future. And this is success. Um, of course, uh, it is also believed that work uh, should bring pleasure to a person, but uh, if it does not bring a high income, uh, for some reason, everybody immediately forgets about it. So the theory of human capital has a number of significant limitations. Uh, first, uh, human capital cannot be um, acquired simply by purchasing, for example, um, educational services. The buyer of such services, uh, at the same time uh, as their seller, uh, act um, as producers of human cre uh, creativity, which cannot be said uh, about the buyer of capital goods. Uh, human capital um, cannot only be bought, but it cannot be sold either, uh, since a person's creative abilities are inseparable from their career. Uh, secondly, uh, family investment uh, in a child's education is not an investment uh, in the economic sense, uh, since parents usually do not expect uh, a material return uh, from such an investment. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the motivation of human capital theory to rationalize uh, investment uh, contradicts modern um, intangible uh, labor incentives. Uh, human capital is a form uh, that creates the appearance of a different content. Uh, this form creates the appearance that human qualities uh, are capital that brings profit uh, to its owner. In reality, however, a different attitude develops here. Um, I mean, if you look at the relationship uh, of the creator with the corporation, then uh, here is the um, uh, acquisition by the capital owner 
of the employee uh, human qualities. And uh, as, a uh, uh, as a consequence, uh, most of the universal social wealth uh, created by this creativity, uh, uh, by this creative activity, yes. Um, the worker uh, loses control of this creativity, but uh, gains uh, some of uh, the wealth uh, he has created. Uh, thus, uh, the actual uh, concept of the category human capital is the relation of subordination to capital, not only of labor and the labor process, but also for the man as an integral uh, creative person. And accordingly, the appropriation by capital of the universal wealth uh, created by this person in the process of the creative, uh, creative activity. Um, the theory of the creative class, or um, as, it, um, uh, as it is sometimes said, the theory of creative human capital has gone uh, a little further. The theory keeps uh, in focus um, the analysis of the creative content of labor and popularizes the idea that the development of the creative class has a positive uh, effect uh, on the country's economy. This is a big step forward uh, as uh, the emphasis uh, is shifting from wages to labor maintenance. However, there are also limitations um, here, uh, starting with the uh, terminology. Uh, the creative class is people who create something new, uh, face uh, a typical situation at work, and also make important responsible decisions. Uh, in the many definitions of creative uh, capital, there is not a word about social benefits. Therefore, uh, research uh, on the creative class includes such professions as, for example, a marketer, an advertising manager, Although in the vast majority of cases, uh, people in these professions are often engaged in imposing uh, unnecessary products and services at uh, unimaginably high prices. It turns out that uh, the followers of the theory seems, uh, seem to tell us um, uh, that the purpose of the activity does not matter. Uh, the main thing uh, is that the means are creative. Uh, thus, uh, the second trend uh, inherent in modern society is the popularization of creativity. On the one hand, uh, it motivates people to create uh, both within uh, the main uh, profession and uh, as an additional freelance. On the other hand, uh, this often gives rise to a situation uh, where, um, where activities uh, that are unnecessary or even harmful to society uh, mistakenly seem to be creative and useful. Often defenders of the theory of human capital say that uh, new speaking uh, the term is uh, excessive pedantry uh, because everyone understands what it means. Uh, in practice, uh, we see that the attitude to economic uh, terms must be as strict and thoughtful as to variables uh, in the exact sciences. Otherwise, the uh, subsequent uh, penetration of the findings uh, of economic theory into society can be destructive. And instead of investing in the quality of educational services, we see that universities are campaign, uh, um, universities are compet uh, competing uh, on the average salary of graduates and not on quality achievements. We see total com uh, commercialization. And um, instead of being creative, uh, in making products and services for people who really need them. We get workers in the uh, sensation industry, the experience industry, uh, which does not explore how to create the things people most need. It uh, explores how to create the impression of being needed and important. Uh, as a result, we get the motto of modern society, to seem but not to be. Uh, therefore, uh, in order to overcome the limitations of human capital uh, existing in the modern world, we must first of all um, start with ourselves and take a responsible uh, approach to economic terms and theories. Uh, thank you everybody for attention. Okay, Tamara, thank you. Uh, we're going to pass to Alini now, please. Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen. Um, I guess it's okay. So if not, please tell me. 
So, привет. Uh, my name is Alini. I am a PhD candidate at University of Campinas in the Economic Development Program, also a member of IBEC. I'm here to present uh, my PhD thesis and or some parts of it and some conclusions. And uh, my theme is housing in the updating of Cuban socialism, considerations about Cuban real estate market. But first, I would like to say I'm very happy to be here in the first seminar and uh, in this partnership between uh, us and Russia. And thank you for everybody who helped to organize and who is here watching and YouTube also. So I will first begin uh, by contextualizing my research at Cuban history. And I will try to be very fast <laughs> because my research uh, it's about real estate market that was allowed in 2011, but this is part of a huge process that began in the 90s. So as you may recall, by the 90s, Cuba has faced a very huge economic crisis because the end of the Soviet Union and because of that, the end of the partnership between Cuba and the Soviet Union and other socialist countries. Uh, and at the same time, by 93, by the intensification of the U.S. embargo towards Cuba. Cuba has faced that big economic crisis and um, because there's nobody to, to sell the sugar produced in Cuba and because they were not an industrialized country, this resulted in a balance of payment crisis and as consequence, a shortage of inputs and goods. The result was hunger, deterioration of the sugar mill infrastructure, economic uh, deterioration, and so on. So this period that began in the 90s and ends in the a end of the 90s and beginning of the next century, it's called a special period in times of peace, because that apply using a planning model that was conceived to be used in a war period. In a case, Cuba went to war uh, probably with the United States, but then it has to be applied to deal with a shortage situation. So as a way out of this crisis, Cuba has changed its economics towards biomedicine or biochemistry and the tourism sector. And that after almost 20 years of that change, uh, Cuba has faced a big economic and social change. It's reality. So. For example, this led uh, Cuba to opening for foreign investments or international companies, of course, uh, regulated by the state and as joint venture with the state. Also led to the liberalization of some markets, for example, agricultural markets, and led to um, more decentralized measures toward employment. As you may remember, after that, the state was the main uh, responsible for all the employments. And before that, uh, there was some kind of activity that it's called cuenta propismo, which is a kind of self-employment that it's now allowed in Cuba since 93. So with all this change during the last 20 years until 2011, Cuba has faced the necessity to update the Cuban socialist model which is uh, to rethink the demands, the popular demands, and a way to go from that. So uh, this necessity culminated in the huge popular discussion that it's called uh, the out updating of Cuban socialism, which was a document released by the Communist Party to the population with some guidelines uh, showing uh, uh, some changes and in, in some uh, adaptations of the Cuban socialism that was uh, discussed in a hundred of me meetings between the Cuban party's delegates and population in their work centers or uh, in their neighborhoods. And there was summed up in a final document that is called lineamientos, which means guidelines, and have almost 300 guidelines to change and to bring new things to Cuban socialism. Uh, one of those guidelines a uh, couple of guidelines are my research team, because in one of those, it was uh, allowed it again to sell and buy homes. And that was forbidden 
for the last 50 years of the revolution. So this restoration of the real estate market came with a lot of rules to avoid urban speculation. For example, Cubans families can only have one house to live and one house to vacation. At the same time, it's not allowed in Cuba to foreigners buy uh, homes or buy real estate property. And the question that arises with all that is how real estate marketing is reorganizing Havana City. Uh, and what can we learn from that about the changes that are going on in Cuba now? I choose to study Havana because it's where the tourism sector is more developed and where we can feel and can observe the tendencies of the changes ongoing in Cuba. But I am very aware that these results do not represent the totality of Cuba. And also, I know that this cannot be replicable in the countryside because there is a total different, different dynamics. Even if we, if we think in a large city as Santiago de Cuba, which is not uh, as big as Havana, we cannot see those things so clearly. So I'll try very fast to explain you my methodology. I've been collecting the ads. Uh, people who want to sell their homes, they made uh, ads for selling them. And since 2013, real estate um, advertisements and websites are allowed. So there is like four big websites where you can uh, uh, put your announcement there. And I've been collecting the information on those sites since 2013, where it began, to last year. And by now I have a very huge database where I can have some information, for example, price, uh, localization of the house, um, construction type, size, so a lot of information. And what I've been trying to do is working with that to see the changes in price and localization. As we can see in the first graphic here, this shows the price of the square meter in Havana. And we can see that there are some neighborhoods, some municipalities that it's almost like a district, it's uh, larger than a neighborhood, that have a higher prices, medium prices. Those neighborhoods at the beginning of this graphic, they represent the tourist areas. So if we think in Playa, Plaza de la Revolución, and like old Havana is where the tourist activities take place. So this show us that those houses are been selling for a higher price, which is related to the possibility to turn those houses into a business by executing a cuenta propista or a self-employment job there. So you can turn those houses into restaurants, you can turn those houses into small hotels, or you can rent a room for a tourist, and then you can join individually this uh, economy that uh, it's related to tourism activity. We can also see in the other graphic that has been a change during time. So this is the medium price uh, in Havana of the square meter. And we can see a drastic change in 2015. This is related to the policy of Barack Obama to be close to, the, to Cuba and Fidel and Raul Castro also to uh, make the relationship in better terms. And as a consequence, the US government has allowed uh, the North American crews that are in the sea to stop in Havana. And that had created a huge influx of North American in uh, Havana and in Cuba. So with that and the expectation of growth of this sector of the economy, the prices had become higher. We can also see the same tendency here in a map. And I have no time to explain the index, but I can tell you that the, the darker the, um, the neighbor, the municipality, that means that the price here is way higher than the medium price of the city of Havana. And in all these uh, municipalities, they have uh, tourist attractions as monuments, uh, churches, or beach. So we can see that the closer the houses are from this uh, location, the higher the price is. So this brings some partial results. 
First, we can see in this process the transformation of housing into a commodity that is exchangeable since 2011. At the same time, we can link this activity with self-employment, the possibility to turn your house into a business. And third, the possibility to turn that business into tourism business. And this also has been proven to have changed the urban configuration of Havana. But <laughs> this led to some more questions that need to be answered. The first one is that, uh, is there private ownership of land income in a form of house ownership and uh, tourism activity and cuenta propismo uh, a threat to collective ownership? Second, can we witness some urban phenomena that are typical from capitalist countries as speculation, gentrification, and spatial segregation? So these questions I intend to disclosure or at least begin to answer in the end of my PhD, and I hope we can discuss it here too. So thank you so much. Thank you, Aline. Now we're gonna pass to Nikolai Akhmedov, please. Thank you. So Gleb, can you help me with uh, my presentation, please? Thanks. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, dear comrades, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at our seminar. My name is Nikolai Ahmedov. I am an independent Marxist researcher at Lobonosov Moscow State University, studying at the Faculty of Political Science and uh, at the French University College in Philosophy. Also, I am the organizer of the post-Marxist study seminar for students and young scientists devoted to the problems of modern Marxism and critical theory. And today I want to tell you a few words about uh, such a controversial, especially in Russia, topic from contemporary leftist discourse as gender studies. And uh, let's talk about the history and content of this issue and try to find out if there can be Marx gender studies. Следующий слайд. Uh, let's first of all def uh, define the definitions. Uh, what I mean by Marxism is an independent doctrine developed by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels and their followers, regularly enriched uh, with the achievements of socioeconomic theory and adapted to a variety of contexts, cultural, historical, national, and of course gender. Class problems, the central category of Marxism, are directly related to race and gender, seeing they have a similar nature, socially constructed, and their manifestations are alienated. Следующий слайд. Speaking about uh, gender studies outside the Marxist theoretical and methodological framework, it should be said that this is a direction of social cultural research that studies how a human being identifies themselves within the framework of a variety of personal and intimate constructions, the most famous of which are masculinity and femininity. Gender studies are subdivided into feminist studies that study the problems of women and femininity, the economic status and emancipation, uh, then sexual studies that uh, study the mechanisms uh, and structures of sexual attraction, and queer studies. Uh, that remove binary positions between male and female, and these bases study dissimilarity, dissimilarity, and that, important to us, it's repression by capitalism. Next. Uh, so let's move on to the context of Marx's uh, gender studies. Uh, the theoretical context itself emerged in the works of Marx and Engels. Uh, this is both the manifesto and later works uh, actually capital, uh, where they touch upon the problem of inequality of women and call them the proletarians of proletarians. Further, one should recall that to the anthropological substellation of capitalism uh, by Friedrich Engels through patriarchy, the gender normative setting of the power of cisgender masculinity in society. And on this basis, directly develop Marxist feminist concepts, Babel, uh, Luxembourg, Zetkin, and others. 
In their writings, uh, they consider the specifics of oppression of uh, women and her special interest in revolutionary transformations. Uh, the theoretical developments uh, of uh, the above authors greatly influenced uh, the practice of the Bolsheviks. Uh, here, one can recall both uh, Lenin himself and Kolontai and Krupskaya, already mentioned, who theoretically and practically developed sexual emancipation, everyday and labor equality, equal participation in social, economic, and political life, and so on. Следующий slide. So, uh, the main theoretical and methodological foundation of Marx's agenda status is materialism. In contrast to essentialism, the doctrine of a priori gender, materialism asserts the socially constructed nature of gender and uh, its dependence on existing condi conditions. Here you can recall uh, the feminist of the second wave, which made the turn towards materialism. Its origins were de Beauvoir and Delphi, uh, who didn't hide uh, their new Marxist views. Следующий slide. So, the main part of my presentation is uh, considering Marx's gender status in the aggregate of theory and practice, we can say uh, that theory is necessary for undertaking the mechanisms of oppression, while practice is necessary for its destruction. Uh, let's talk about theory first. Gender imperialism is a socio-political order that subordinates all gender practices to cisgender masculinity, the power of normative men, a conditional global superclass of exploiters. Uh, why is such power bad from the point of view of Marxist optics? Uh, first of all, it supports economically unequal social uh, reproduction. Uh, when women are always in secondary roles in society, at work, in culture, and so on, you ask, and uh, rightly so, what to do with a huge amount of literature, paintings, music, uh, dedicated to women, especially essential and affectionate relationship to them. In these cases, uh, the woman really takes the first place but uh, she doesn't exist in them as a woman, but as an object of desire. Uh, that is, men establish the following order. Everything that they are and everything that is natural is normal and independent. Everything that is uh, aligned to them, they will present in the light that is beneficial to them. Women as objects of desire, sexual minorities as objects of hatred, non-binary people as unhealthy, etc. Uh, this is all ensured uh, is uh, gender in gender ideologies, which Marxism opposes, as well as any other ideology. The question remains, how does this relate to class or economic affiliation? The economic initiative belongs to men and even in the class section, if you look uh, at the proletarians, then women proletarians are much more disadvantaged than men proletarians and are dependent on them. Uh, which creates a separate discourse of them, representatives of abnormal sexuality and gender from the poorest classes are much more sus uh, susceptible to capitalism hegemony than gender normative representatives of such classes. Uh, next slide. Uh, particularly noteworthy uh, in the Marxist view of the relationship between race and gender, including uh, in the post-colonial aspect and sexuality. Uh, speaking about race, a topic that has become a new Marxist classic uh, thanks uh, to Fanon and Davis, it is important to note uh, that uh, uh, the racial component doubles uh, the burden of gender exploitation and for example, a white woman is a victim of patriarchy, then imagine what kind of black woman who is subjected to its repression, not only for her gender, but also her race in relation to gender. Colonialism in sex industry is flourishing, especially richly, because of the percep perception of representatives of non-white races as a dehumanized subjects. They are subjected to the greatest use of humiliation. Next. So, uh, where is the solution? We find a way out in the practice of Marx's gender studies, namely in gender decolonization. Goal is to stop using gender identity as a socioeconomic prejudice lab label. Uh, to this end, uh, many contemporary Marxist feminists create public organizations 
aimed uh, at political and socially consolidating actions against uh, neoliberalism. Here we can also bring social creativity uh, when representatives of abnormal and repressed genders create counter hegemonic products and thereby uh, decompose the existing neoliberal discourses and uh, after each uh, the existing of capitalistic relations and of course science and creativity. Next. Uh, so here I want to draw your attention to the most significant, in my opinion, works uh, on Marxist gender studies and uh, uh, in particular uh, Marxist feminist studies. So, and uh, the final one. Uh, summing up uh, the above, I would like to say uh, that we contemporary Marxists uh, needed to pay special attention to the issues of sexuality and gender and not to marginalize them. Since it is since it is uh, about sexuality and gender that are at the origins of patriarchal oppression that has survived in the privileging neoliberal order, and when we will destroy it in root, and we are already destroying it in root, uh, it will be necessary to remove the existing oppositions to build a society optimistic project for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, now we're going to pass to Fabio Castro. Vivir bien. Uh, the sound are, are closed. Thank you, Carlos and everybody. Just a second to put my presentation. Uh, Oh. Just a second, I have a problem here. One minute. Fabio, just I am with problems in my presentation. Uh, just do you, want, an, do you want me to? Otherwise, share? I it it isn't going. Uh, okay, now I can share maybe. No, thank you. Now I can. Everybody can see? It's okay? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry for the, the this little problem. Well, uh, good morning, I'm Fabio. I will present a uh, part of my PhD research in World Political Economy, which is the discussion around lithium and vivir bien in Bolivia, fundamentally, a uh, discussion about sovereignty and transition. Uh, the work on which this presentation is based is a text which is part of this book and which will be published tomorrow by Rutledge Press, specifically chapter five, which I wrote in partnership with professors Paulo and Sinclair, both members of Old Guard of our research group. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what interests me most in discussion Bolivia is to understand the idea of proposed sovereignty and transition project in the country. And that is what I will try to demonstrate here. Bolivia began to transform in 2006, however, coming from a revolutionary historical movement intensified between 2000 and 2005, when two civil wars took place in the country, the so-called water war and the gas war. 
It was the culmination of the accumulation of peasant and indigenous resistance struggles. This process led at the end of 2005, after the fall of two presidents and a transitional government, to the victory of Evo Morales, the first indigenous president in the country's history, uh, through mass movement towards socialism. It is important to highlight that given the strength of the social movement, Mass is not considered a part, but rather a political instrument of people's sovereignty. The character of the government of social movements was strengthened and institutionalized these struggles through a new constitution granted in 2009, establishing the plurinational state of Bolivia. Evidently, this, do, this does not happen in a context of tranquility. This whole process was deeply, <laughs> deeply marked by a permanent scenario of conflicts, tensioned mainly by counter-revolutionary organizations in the Bolivian East. Sectors of the oligarchy from colonial origin established themselves around separatist demands and with an openly Eurocentric and anti-indigenous character. In any case, the construction, <laughs> the constitution was established even in the midst of this dispute which guarantees to Evo Morales even greater popularity and a very strong capacity to govern, leading him to more two terms of as president. In Bolivia, this transition process is called the Proceso de Cambio. That means the process of change, whose meaning is what mass will call community socialism to live in well. They sought this perspective in the native Bolivian community, the idea of vivir bien, and it is the horizon that guides the construction of the countering project in Bolivia. The former president, Evo Morales, who is the main character of this movement, sees vivir bien as a system that transcends capitalism, a doctrine and practice that is based on the philosophy of indigenous peoples. He points out the need to build a society for living well, based on ethical and moral principles that stands as the antithesis of capitalism and put forward community socialism as its way of consolidating it. He emphasized that it can only be built on the basis of life in harmony with nature and complementarity between peoples. On the other hand, another very important character that is also in this photo is Alvaro Garcia Linera, the vice president of the Evo Morales period, who is a very important Marxist in Latin America. He puts the concrete questions of this transition process. Linera believes that the state cannot create the community because it's the perfect antithesis of the community. The state itself is unable to restore the life-given metabolism between human beings and nature. In the sense, I state within the scope of the transition has the purpose of protecting the anti-capitalist community and cooperative initiatives and improving the living conditions of workers. In that way, two workers are given time to try new social forms until it's possible to overcome the Bougogie order in an universal and irreversible movement. From this perspective, a new economic model is established in, in the country, the, the so-called new social community and productive economic model, whose central figure is the economist Luis Arce, who from the beginning of the government of Evo Morales was the minister of economy, and today he is the president of Bolivia. The idea of this new economic model is to place the state as the protagonist, in turn, the material basis of this perspective is established with the nationalization of the country's natural resource, whose approval had been given through a plebiscite even before Morales' electoral victory. With the private non-appropriation <coughs> of most of the country's surpluses, the way in is opened for a great process of income and distribution social inclusion programs, infrastructure construction, economic diversification, and fundamentally the industrialization of natural resources, which I will quickly present in the case of lithium later. In other words, in Bolivia, an idea of endogenous growth was proposed, straightening the coherence and domestic demand, which 
was anchored in a particular perspective of macroeconomic stability, leading Bolivia to be one of the countries in the greatest, <laughs> one of the countries with the greatest economic growth in the region during the Morales govern government. This macroeconomic stability is proposed as an antithesis to the neoliberal perspective. In the Bolivian case, established is the starting point for social change, not the end sought. This is the flow chart I created to simplify the, the understanding of this new economic model. I highlighted that it is expected that the cooperative and the community spheres will be the vectors of the transition to vivir bien through the rescue of alternatives forms of social organization coming from the communities that originate in the country. As it should be, the Bolivian model of transition has generated much controversy in the interpretations elaborated around the world about the process of change. Was it a new model with the same old problems? How to exploit natural resources without being character characterized as now extractivism, which promotes degradation of the environment. How to sovereign without being able to break completely with external dependence? How to transition to socialism without breaking with a private appropriation of wealth? How to live well without eradicating poverty? How to overcome the counter-revolution and its permanent conflicts? In our view, this model can only be appreciated from the perspective of building balance in a country historically subjected to systematic violence promoted since the colonial system. Therefore, it is configured as a revolutionary moment within a long process of struggles for the decolonization of the country. Here I expose some of the socioeconomic advances that broke with the secular model of misery perpetuation in Bolivia, although there is still a long road ahead for its overcoming and emancipation of workers. A very interesting transformation that demonstrates the popular strength that the movement toward socialism has within the Bolivian population. Uh, in the midst of this process of change in the economic sphere, the industrialization of legion is established as a decisive strategy for the affirmation of sovereignty. This is because legion is a, a strategic element in the energy transformation of the, president, of the present and has a very high demand in the world market, mainly from the dissemination of the electric vehicles. Bolivia has the largest legion reserve in the world, located in the Uyuni South Flat, which you can see in this photo, an evaporation pool of the Uyuni South Flat that I was able to visit in 2019. In the sense, the industrialization of lithium is one of the main bets for the future generations in Bolivia, within the perspective of, of advancing the process of change, an autonomous and sovereign project for the exploitation and industrialization of resource was established with the end of making the entire battery production chain endogenous. This strategy was designed by seeking international partners who did not place themselves as bosses, but as partners, in the words of Morales himself. Agreements have been signed with a German company and a Chinese company for the industrialization of Bolivian lithium. The agreement with German company provides for the production of batteries within Bolivia for export to Germany, which in the world market has been left without access to the raw material of batteries and aims to transform its automobile fleet into electric vehicles. The prospect was to start exporting batteries to Germany in 2023. The project I read has more than 10 years of research and development, but it is still producing on a pilot scale. Two prospects for 2023 were the prospects of 2023 were interrupted by the coup and the partnership were treated and are currently in the renegotiation phase. The, these expectations have become so positive with the progress of the project that even Bolivian businessmen have started to develop autonomous technology to produce electric vehicles within Bolivia. This is the case of the Quentin company that developed this small electric car and presented it in the mid-2019. 
developing an electric car with its own technology is too much. Can you imagine a country that historically had, was a supplier of strategic raw materials now wants to be autonomous, sovereign, and still transition to socialism? Coup de terre. Shortly months after this photo was taken, a military <coughs> sorry. Short months after this photo was taken, a military and violent coup d'état took place in November 2019, marked by the assault on power by an extreme right wing aligned with external interest and deeply racist. The government of exception took power with the narrative of calling for new elections as soon as possible. However, they tried everything to perpetuate themselves in power and avoid holding new elections. There were four postponements that were just not more extensive because the popular movement returned to, to the streets demanding the election. In any case, a year of coup government led to a process of strong regression in a scenario of political persecution, which led many cadres of Bolivian left to go into exile. A year after coup, immersed in, a, in the reorganization of social movements for the reconstruction of the country against the coup, which gained the strength in the movement for demanding new elections, Mass back to power with a crushing victory in the first round over the heterogeneous group of the Bolivian right wing. The economist Luis Arce, president elect, was tasked with resuming the process of change. In the photo, Luis Arce is, the center, is at the center celebrating the victory with representatives of social movements after a very tense election pool. Even the small tanks of war surrounded the mass headquarters in the midst of our imminent victory. Finally, to close the discussion, I put our interpretation of the process. In our view, vivir bien as a more ideological measure can be thought of as the cultural revolution necessary to move towards a, societ a society that transcends capitalism, something like the new man taught by Che Guevara that overcomes the limitations of 20th century socialism and moves toward a break with a mercantile and destructive society to find balance between human life and nature. Therefore, the historical and transforming meaning of vivir bien refers to the search for the construction of balance in a plurinational society. This process takes place in a context full of imperfections arising from five centuries of institutional violence and despite its intrinsic contradictions, it has managed to achieve significant economic and social emancipatory improvements. However, in addition to a sovereign nation project and the solution of some historical problems, new tensions and contradictions have emerged. That is why the possibility of looking at an emancipated horizon for Bolivian people is only real to the extent that a long process of decolonization and the construction of a new society is assumed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, <clears throat> now uh, uh, we've got now some questions. Uh, a question from uh, So, uh, well, uh, if some if someone uh, wants to to make a question to to our researchers, I I can find here in the in the chat the, the question. So, ah, uh, we got a question from Enrique to Tamara. Um, is it possible to say that the theory of human capital is the foreshadowing of jobless society? If someone has another question to Tamara, 
we can put it and then we we, we she I uh one minute it's Alexander Buscalin. I also wrote in chat question to Tamara. Ah yes, Alexander. Uh, sorry. Uh, no problem. If you would like to, to, to make it now. So but uh, it was about interconnection between category human capital and marketization of education. Uh, if Tamara see any connection, the more we have marketization of uh, education, the more we have category human capital, but not human being. Instead of human being, human capital. I want to stress this capital. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I have some uh, problems with sound. Uh, Alexander, can you please uh, repeat your question? Yes, Tamara, the question is, uh, now we have more and more uh, in academic sphere and in political sphere category human capital, and this mm -hmm. is capital, yeah, and uh, I ask, do you see any connection between marketization, commercialization of education from one hand and popularity of category human capital, not human being, not man? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Um, so um, uh, I can start uh, with the first question. Uh, and I would say that uh, the theory of human capital uh, is um, a foreshadowing uh, of a society of unhappy people uh, since economic, re uh, since economic uh, rationality in education uh, does not uh, deprive people of jobs. Uh, and the race of uh, success um, deprives a person of the opportunity to be who he wants. Uh, in mathematical terms, um, uh, pursuing uh, the dream of financial success, um, it is impossible uh, to achieve a, sufficiency, a, a sufficiently successful state. You can only achieve the necessary successful state. Uh, and recently European scientists uh, have uh, begun to um, actively investigate the economic causes uh, of uh, depression. Um, and among them, uh, there is also uh, the constant um, dissatisfaction of people with their position uh, because uh, there is always someone more successful. Uh, and um, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can I uh, have uh, one minute uh, to uh, to answer the second question? Because uh, because uh, I have it again. <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, because uh, I, I need a one minute break. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, we can pass to to other researchers, and and then she will answer. So uh, we've got here uh, to Alini. Jacob asks to Alini, is the move to open the real estate market provoking significant opposition from Cuban Marxists committed to public ownership? And Alexander, Busgalin to Alini. Uh, we have an interesting PhD student, Alexander, who is working on Cuba. The question, do you think that Chinese track can be, must be realized in Cuba? Will you advise them to do the same as China, as China? So, that's the questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, Jacob, it's very hard <laughs> to, um, for me to answer that because also the Cubans, they, they complain a lot. They are very critical, very political. So it's a hard question. For my point of view, uh, the demand for opening the real estate sector was a very popular demand because uh, there was a problem that people were really stuck in their homes since the end of the revolution. So if you are like a teenager in the end of the revolution, then your family have grown, 
you, you, you are older now and you are at the same house. So there was this problem of ex exchange, which was very huge. And although there were like the permutas, that are like swaps of the homes, they were very complicated. And by the end, what was happening was like um, informal buying and selling. And that was a problem too. So I think they are not really opposed to that because also the... Um, um, the revolution can um, assure that every Cuban would have a house. But I think that the opposition comes when talking about uh, quantapropismo or self-employment, and especially how it's being used, the houses have been used to uh, become a business. So one of the things that are, they are very critical now is all this ideology that comes with the self-employment about uh, your individual goals and how this brings a discourse or um, a mindset that opposes to the revolution mindset, which is solidarity and uh, fraternal and so on. So I think it's still very hard to, to see those direct questions, uh, uh, oppositions against real estate because it's also very regulated. But if we look at the other side with the self-employment, then we can find some critics. Uh, now about Alexandra's uh, question, I would really much enjoy meeting Alexandra. So I hope we can make contact. And about the Chinese path, uh, it's very hard for me to, to answer that. But in, the, in terms of economic in general, this path, I don't think it's possible because of the main constraints of the Cuban economy. It, it's very uh, hard to imagine such a, a way of industrializing and, and production, actually, as the Chinese um, history. I think they, uh, there is a movement towards China. Now, with the coronavirus crisis, also they have come closer to China, but as a partnership, a commercial partnership. But I think that the Vietnam model would be more um, likable. Now, about the urban path, the Chinese urban path, then I think it would not be that case because the Cuban revolution is very worried about people having houses because that was the main problem after the revolution. And the Chinese uh, had uh, libraries like uh, they had made all the, the land private ownership. So the effects of that in China now, it's kind of a warning Cuba about the, this impact. So we see if we, we look like in China's building a lot of uh, ghost cities that now are not being lived with, with nobody and like this huge uh, cities that were built uh, so fast, I don't think they will follow that path especially because Cuba has a shortage in cement, which makes this uh, kind of uh, impossible. So I think um, they will not follow that path. And in urban area, I would not recommend it too. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, Aline, thank you. We've got a question to Nikolai uh, from Fabiana. Could you talk more about the relation between Marxist and gender studies in Russia, how Marxist has been considering the fight against female oppression. Is it part of revolution and the human emancipation? Uh, so Fabiana, first of all, thank you for your question. Of course, uh, women emancipation is a part of uh, the global uh, revolution of human beings. Uh, but unfortunately, I cannot but admit that in Russia, a lot of Marxist studies treat the problem of gender and sexual minorities with a great skepticism. And uh, if in some Marxist studies it is assumed, uh, despite the achievements of October 17, uh, to abandon these categories uh, as uh, non-economic, then in other homosexuality, for example, is still considered as a bourgeois manifestation. Uh, Marxism has always been renewed uh, uh, in accordance with the achievements of social theory. So we must not stop now. 
and uh, the Russian Marxist and left-wing academy practically doesn't touch upon gender discourses uh, because, first of all, it is fraught with homophobic law. However, every year, more and more grassroots social movements uh, include in their agendas uh, the struggle for women's rights, the uh, emancipation of minorities, and so on. And thus, uh, this can be confidence uh, that sooner or later it will reach in the academy. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we've got a question to Fabio from Enrique, actually a provocation. Uh, <laughs> is evil a indigenous canis? Well, uh, he can always like to joke with me, but okay. <laughs> what pays is that the, the economist Luis Arce used the main uh, tools of Keynesianism to organize the economy during the process of change. <laughs> uh, <coughs> they, are, they don't believe in, in the... Keynes' perspective uh, as a, like everything. They use the, the tools of Keynesianism to organize the economy during the process of change to uh, give time to workers to organize a new society. That's the, the way they use this, this economic theory. Mainly the economist that now is the president of Bolivia, Luis Arce. There is an economist... Uh, uh, that I read was professor in USA and everything, but he are he has uh, uh, very clear that the the use of these tools is to uh, transit to another society. That's this. <clears throat> okay. Is that another question? Oh, so I can we have a answer. short time. Uh, ah, yes, we, we got yes. A, a question <laughs> okay. from Alexander to Tamara. Mm -hmm. Is it right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, as I remember, uh, it was about uh, the link uh, between the theory of human capital and the commercial commercialization <laughs> and uh, marketing education. Uh, so, uh, to my mind, uh, there is a direct link uh, because. Um, uh, striving to maximize income instead of maximizing the quality that is inherent uh, in the theory of human capital uh, leads to bad consequences. Uh, for example, uh, leading U.S. Uh, universities admit people uh, in sport competitions, uh, although they are inferior to other students um, in terms of knowledge. Or, for example, in Russia, university departments are uh, advertised uh, for the highest salaries of graduates. Nobody says that the graduates of our faculty have uh, invented something. Uh, so hopefully these practical examples give an idea of uh, my opinion about this question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Tamara. Is there any question more? So, uh, I think we finish here, so, um, and I, I, I don't know if uh, Paulo, someone wants wants to to, to finish this this meeting. The sound, Paulo. Uh, uh, yes, we uh, first of all, I, I think that uh, uh, Buzz Galen uh, uh, made the word. He begins. Ah, okay, you will be the last. Great. <laughs> so, friends, uh, first of all, thank you so much for very interesting presentations. I had uh, much more questions uh, than uh, I wrote, but uh, the time limits um, are essential and it was very well organized. But uh, I want to stress some important points. 
first uh, interconnection between fundamental changes in uh, the nature of capitalism from one hand and the life of uh, personality, uh, human being. Uh, different aspects of this question, uh, housing, education, culture, uh, healthcare, uh, relations between men and women, uh, all these aspects are fundamentally interconnected with the system of economic, social economic relations and political struggle. And these aspects were uh, reflected in our seminar and nobody wanted to say, uh, I have my narrow topic and uh, all other questions are not important for me, so please don't ask me about politics. Uh, we have in Russia such anecdote, uh, young boy is coming home and asks, uh, father, dad, I'm so hungry. And the answer is very simple. Please don't disturb me with politics. So we know that uh, our life is full of hunger, hunger of uh, culture, hunger of uh, normal uh, healthy life, hunger of uh, uh, non-alienated uh, human relations. And this is politics. And this is uh, in the same time, uh, academic problem problem for academic analysis, theoretical analysis. And I'm very glad that we have such a seminar. Uh, for practical steps uh, in the future, I think we can have in two months, maybe late April, a uh, seminar together with uh, young Marxist scholars from uh, East and West European countries, maybe from other cities of uh, Russia and ex-Soviet Union countries. Uh, I think you have, uh, you Brazilians have a lot of contacts in other countries of Latin America. We have some young, uh, interesting students in China, in the United States. And I hope we can organize a really international seminar or maybe a small conference for not three hours, but maybe longer with bigger breaks and more debates. So this is an announcement for the future. In any case, we definitely will have uh, March 25th, 26th conference devoted to 100th anniversary of GOSPLAN, uh, institution which started uh, planned, uh, planification in our country. And Gleb Maslov, thank you, Gleb, uh, mentioned that today is, uh, exactly today is anniversary of GOSPLAN. So if you have some ideas to tell a few words about planification in modern situation, about history of planification, you're welcome. Uh, we are very glad to invite you to participate in the conference. And Gleb Maslov is foreign minister of our network. So you can have direct personal contact with this wonderful and very important guy. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. But he's really responsible for foreign contacts. And the late May, we have a big forum, Moscow Academic Economic Forum. It uh, includes typically up to 100 foreign guests and uh, up to 2,000 Russian participants, big event. And uh, in the frameworks of this forum, we plan to organize Marxist Congress with broad number of questions. And uh, this is also agenda for us. If you have any other initiatives, you have coordinators and we are very open for development of this, I think very important and very fruitful, beautiful first step. Thank you so much. Yeah. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Congratulations to our youngest scientists, in special to our senior scientists Alexander Buzgali for the decision of create the seminar. We hope that such seminars have a long life and in any manner could spread science compromises with great human questions of our times. Young science are the vital forces of carry out these objectives. Long life to our seminar and to our scientists. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Paulo. So with this, we, we finish this, this meeting. It was a pleasure to, to meet you. Uh, so goodbye. 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 Goodb